know, I love all these influence principles we've been talking about in this series, but I have to admit that the three we're going to cover in this session here may be among my favorites. And that's because they're, they're so subtle. They're so indirect. They can influence people without those folks ever knowing that it's some sort of persuasion attempt. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I also love them because they're, they're modeled so well and so clearly by Jesus. So there's a lot of ground to cover. Let's just dive right into these three principles. The first one, first principle of influence we're going to cover in this session is storytelling. Tell a story. Do you use storytelling when you're trying to, to influence someone? We should. After all, this is Jesus' primary pathway to persuasion, isn't it? When you think about his ministry, when you think about uh, how he influenced people, he's going around telling stories. He's telling the prodigal son story, and he's telling the story of the Good Samaritan, and he's telling the story of the workers in the vineyard and the parable of the talents, and on and on it goes. And why did he tell stories? Well, it connects him to his audience, for one thing, and we talked about that back in principle three, the importance of knowing your audience and connecting to them, but also because stories are easy to listen to, and they're entertaining, and they're, they're easy to retain and pull out the, the lessons from them, and, and you can transmit them from one person to the next, and from one family to the next, and from one generation to the next. And beyond that, they can have such a powerful way of, of changing the way somebody thinks, and therefore the way somebody acts. I can tell you about God's unconditional love, but if I tell you the story of the prodigal son, you know, that's going to stay with you much more likely. It'll stay with you, and it'll, uh, it'll be more meaningful and more memorable and, and perhaps more powerful, and it may have a way of shaping your thinking that you know, simple, straightforward, if Jesus was on the mountainside going through his bullet points on, on a PowerPoint slide, it just wouldn't have had the same kind of effect, right? So storytelling. Um, in the Old Testament, we see this throughout the Old Testament. In fact, the whole Old Testament is a story. But one of the most profound instances of influence in all the Old Testament is Nathan with David. Remember that story? King David had just uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. He'd taken another man's wife. And then he had that man, Uriah, killed. And it was Nathan's job to convince the king that what he did was wrong, that he was in error, and that he needed to repent. And, and this is. Uh, sort of a precarious thing for Nathan when you think about it. I mean, David had, has shown that he's willing to commit murder. And you know, there are various handy ancient Middle Eastern ways of disposing of people. He could have disposed of Nathan the same way he disposed of Uriah. So what does Nathan do to try to convince King David? Well, he tells a story. He tells that great story of the rich man with a lot of sheep and the poor man with just one sheep and how the rich man had a visitor and he needed to prepare a sheep for dinner and so he didn't take one from his many flock, he took the one sheep that the poor man had. And King David gets his back up and he, he's outraged at this. He's just livid. Is, is this a true story? Did this really happen? Is this man in my kingdom? Bring him here. That man must die. And that's when Nathan springs the trap and he says, that man is you. It's you. You're, you are that man. And he shows them through the analogous story that he, in fact, did that same thing that the rich man in the story did. And the repentance just overcomes King David. And we hear about that repentance in Psalm 51. That's what a great story can do, especially through the element of, of surprise and especially when it evokes emotion in us. It's an indirect pathway to persuasion. This is why Hollywood's so influential, isn't it? What do they do? They, over and over again, they tell good stories. Well, some of them are not so good, but they tell stories and they've been able to shape an entire culture. They've been able to shape the way we think. They've been able to shape our worldview just through the stories that they tell. This is why the Apostle Paul was, was so effective retelling that Damascus Road story, right? And this is why we can be so effective by just telling our Christian te testimony, by just offering it to people. And, you know, it's important to have a good apologetic defense of the gospel and be ready with that. But sometimes it's better just to talk about what God's doing in your life and what God has done in your life. And that is enough to plant the seeds to get somebody moving along in God's direction. So the point is, find a story if you're looking to influence somebody. Find a story that illustrates your point rather than just charging in there with a, with a bunch of straightforward reasons. You know, a clergyman named uh, Anthony DeMello, he said it well. He said, the shortest distance between truth and a human being is a story. That's fascinating, isn't it? The shortest distance between truth and a human being is a story. We should travel that more efficient road more often. If you want to influence like Jesus, you know, 
learn how to tell stories more effectively. And this week in the homework, we're going to, to go through how, uh, a lot of practical tips on, on how we can do that. Next principle, we call it constructing a contrast. And to, um, to, to teach this principle, I'd like to not just tell you about it, but actually illustrate it. To do that, I need a volunteer. And uh, Sam, let me volunteer you, since you're, you got your eyes closed. What's that, you've fallen asleep, just like in my class. Come on up here, behind these three buckets of water here. You see, one is hot, one is warm, one is cold. I'm going to ask you to put a hand in the cold bucket and in the hot bucket, and then at some point move them to the warm bucket. I think this one's about oh, 40 degrees. This one's probably 80 degrees. This one's about 200 degrees. <laughs> Just put them all the way down there in the bucket. You're going to need to hold them there for about 30 seconds in order for, for this to, to work. And uh, why we need to, well, we need to kill some time here. Let me tell you about Sam House. My, my editor, my friend, um, he is uh, an outstanding, compassionate human being. We were in downtown Nashville recently, and uh, just walking on the street, and we saw this homeless guy sitting on the ground. Remember that, Sam? And he's, he's playing a guitar, and he's got his hat out in front of him, and uh, he's, he's tapping his shoe. And you could see that, that the sole of his shoe was, was coming undone. And so yeah, I felt really bad, and I reached for my wallet, and Sam said, no, 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 Mike, allow me. And he pulls out this wad of cash. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, Lifeway's paying really well these days. And it's a new president or something. Wrapped in, in a rubber band, he goes up to the man, takes the rubber band, and gives it to him and says, here, you can fix your shoe with this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He gave him the cash. <laughs> Sam, this is what I... <laughs> God bless you, brother. This is what I'd like you to do. Now, move your hands slowly from the, uh, the, the, these two buckets to the middle bucket, and tell me your perception of that water. What, what's, the, what's the temperature of that water? Does it feel warm? Does it feel cold? Does it, how does it feel to you? My left hand feels cold, and my right hand feels warm. That's interesting. It's the same water. It's the same water. It's the same Sam. Yes. Sam I am. And, and here you are telling me that this water, now th this is fascinating. Don't you think? I mean, we have influenced Sam to think two different things about the exact same water, haven't we? It's not because he's dumb. It's because it's the contrast principle. I want to I share that with you. But first, thank you for being a good sport, Sam. I have a present for you. Here, you can dry your hands with this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Let me see. Thanks, Sam. <clears throat> contrast principle, it's basically this. It's the, the difference between things greatly influences our perceptions and our decisions. You ever notice that? It's not always the merit of the thing itself, but it's what came before it. It's, it's, it's our benchmark. It's the thing to which we're comparing it. Like, uh, if, I, if I put three pieces of broccoli on my kid's plate, you know, they might not be too happy about that because they're, they're comparing that to having no broccoli on their plate. But if I say to them, would you like 10 pieces of broccoli or three tonight? <laughs> ah, all of a sudden, I've changed their context, the context and, and the contrast you know, three pieces isn't so bad, right? Or um, like anybody who's taken a, a trip to a destitute area, gone on a mission trip to, to Haiti or someplace like that, come back and we're just filled with gratitude and contentment for the abundance of our life. Why? Because we're no longer comparing what we have to our neighbor next door, but we're comparing it to those disorient folks down there in Haiti who have nothing. It's influenced us to think differently about our circumstances. Salespeople know this too. You ever notice that they, they show you the more expensive stuff first and then the less expensive stuff later? Why? Because even though you might not be willing to buy that expensive stuff, the less expensive stuff seems really cheap in the context of the more expensive. Right? My, my kids know this, and, and kids generally know this. They, um, they know that if you want a dog, you ask for a horse. <laughs> Why? Because to dad, the dog doesn't seem so bad when uh, the alternative is a horse. My, my wife knows this principle, too. She wanted a dog, so she asked for a fifth kid. <laughs> we went shopping for the dog that afternoon. <laughs> the Apostle Paul used this so effectively, and we're going to show you in the homework several places where he used it. But just, just one for our, our video here. He says in Romans chapter 8, for I consider, and listen for the, the contrast in this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the joy and the, the paradise that, that is awaiting us. You think we're, you're going through some sort of trial, you're having some sort of difficulty. 
probably are, but don't compare it to how much marginally better things could be today here on, on Earth. Compare it to what awaits you. This is just a profound principle to transform the way we think, to transform our attitude, to transform our peace, to transform our joy and contentment and gratitude and so on. I love the way Jesus used it. He used it several times, but you might remember when they put a paralytic before him. And Jesus looks at the man with compassion and he says, have courage, my son. Your sins are forgiven. And the scribes are all upset about that, of course, because you know, only God can forgive sins, and Jesus is a blasphemer. And Jesus whips out the contrast principle, and he says to them, which of these is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or rise and walk home? If I can tell him to rise and walk home, I can forgive his sins. And that's exactly what he does. If I can do the greater thing, I can do the lesser thing. Look at the lilies of the field. God clothes them. He's going to clothe you all the more. Look at the birds of the air. He feeds them. He's going to feed you all the more. Jesus is using this contrast principle to change the way we think about our circumstances. And as we think, so we act. It's simply profound. So you can influence a person's perception and thinking and choices by investing the time to think through what kind of contrast you can come up with. You, know, you want to influence your boss, take that diamond of an idea that you have and put it against some sort of black background rather than against a white background and see how much brighter it shines. You know, that, that diamond metaphor is actually a nice segue into this last principle I want to talk about today. And that principle, oddly enough, is called find a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> As if storytelling and contrast weren't powerful enough, you know, God gives us this other way to transform the way people think and transform their attitude and transform their behavior. A metaphor, as, as you probably know, is a, a comparison that creatively suggests that one thing resembles another. Or as Aristotle put it, um, it's the act of giving a thing a name that belongs to something else. We use these all the time, don't we? Like we say business is war. You know, that, that's a metaphor, and it can change the way people act. There's actually research on that. Or if I say I have too many plates spinning at the same time, that's a metaphor. It's a jungle out there. We need to think outside the box. She has a, a magnetic personality. Right? The service in this place is slow as molasses. The other place is fast as lightning. You know, my, um, my kid's youth pastor used one of these recently, and it was just terrific. He, he said that God wants you to be a superhero, but you have to watch out for the kryptonite of sin. And it stayed with my oldest son for a long time, and it changed the way he saw sin and, and the way he, he knew that sin gets in the way of doing God's work God's way. And, and that's what a good metaphor can do. If you're in the workplace, don't think about these people as your coworkers or your employees or your bosses. or What, what would happen if you thought about them as your congregation? And you're in full-time ministry when you step through the door. And, uh, you're not just some indentured servant. If you think of these people as your congregation, how would that change your attitude at work? How would that change the way you resolve conflict, your willingness to forgive people, your willingness to be a, a living witness in, in that environment? That's what a great metaphor can do. It can change the way we think. I heard Christianity described recently as a lifeboat. I'm sorry, yeah, a lifeboat, not a pleasure boat. Christianity is a lifeboat, not a pleasure boat. How important would that be to a new believer who thinks that once I become Christian, you know, everything's going to get better? Well, no, you're, you're saved. You know, God has, uh, has given you this, this lifeboat, but it's not going to be easy. It's not a pleasure boat. It's a great way of communicating very efficiently a profound truth of the Christian life. Aristotle, in fact, said that the greatest thing by far is to be a master of metaphor when we're trying to persuade somebody. The greatest thing by far. It's not who we are, it's not the logic of our argument, but the use of metaphor? Wow, that's, uh, that's worth considering. And somebody a whole lot smarter than Aristotle used metaphors all the time, didn't he? He called himself the gate and the door, someone through whom we must go. Right? He called himself the bread of life and living water, something we would take in for nourishment. He called himself the vine, something to which we branches need to stay connected if we want to survive. And he called himself the good shepherd, a kind guide who's going to kind of take us to where we need to go. He called himself the way and the truth and the life, you know, a person we need to follow if we want our life sustained. He also talked about the religious leaders of his day and called them whitewashed tombs. How's that for a metaphor? 
Could anybody hearing Jesus' words look at these people the same way again? You know, there they are, all white and clean and pristine and perfect on the outside and rotten and full of corruption on the inside. They're not wise men. They're not authorities. They're not pathways to heaven. They're whitewashed tombs. Through two little words, you can just change the way people thought about these individuals. See, metaphor is not just a colorful figure of speech. It's not just something that, that we do to, to spice up a bland conversation. It's a powerful tool of persuasion that can forever change the way somebody thinks and the way somebody acts. So we, we, sh we too should try to become masters of metaphor. Storytelling, constructing a contrast, finding a metaphor, right? You master these three influence strategies and co-labor with God to, to really put them into practice. You're gonna make a difference in a lot of people's lives.